to take a moment to welcome you to North Star. Very excited that you're here today. I want to encourage you to go ahead and take out your message notes. I want to welcome all those who are watching us online and online. You can just simply click on the tab that says notes and that way you'll be able to follow along with us. Uh, because what we're going to talk about today is very important because I think that all of us at some point in life feel like giving up. Uh, maybe you're not there right now. Um, let me just say this. Uh, you'll want to keep this message because you're going to need it one day, right? Uh, because all of us have moments in life when we feel like we want to give up. Your life is not a 50-yard dash. In fact, your life is a marathon. And it's important to understand that as you run the race, uh, the goal is to finish the race and to finish it well. The question is not, are you going to fall down along the way? Because all of us stumble and fall. Every single one of us are going to fall along the way. But as your pastor, the thing that I want more than anything else is to help you to know how to pace yourself, how you can get to the end, do everything that you need to do to make sure that you cross the finish line and that you finish well. Now, sadly, a lot of people um, shrivel up on the inside before they die. Let me just kind of illustrate that for you. Uh, they really don't get connected to God. They don't know how to live a vibrant life. Or maybe you are a Christian and you're connected to God, but your life is not as vibrant as it could be. And so what I've said is that they're, I mean, they may, they may be living, but really they're dead on the inside. Now, let's go back just for a moment and let me help you to understand a marathon. If you've never ran a marathon, you've never been in a marathon, um, at the very beginning of a marathon, uh, it's packed, right? I mean, you look up there, everybody is at the starting line. And that's the way it is in life, right? Everybody starts out well. Everybody wants to run the race. And usually when you get started, there's a lot of people around you. But along the way, what happens is as the race continues... All of a sudden, there becomes this distance between the runners, right? And, and, and you find yourself at a place that it's not like this anymore, but people are running, and as they're running, uh, there, there's fewer people that are with you along the way. It's the same in your life. As you're running the race, as you are trying to get to the finish line, it's important to understand that giving up is always worse than messing up. We're all going to mess up, but you can't give up, right? You've got to keep moving forward. You've got to keep giving it your all. And what happens is, is somewhere along the way, people begin to get discouraged. And discouragement, guys, is what destroys us and oftentimes causes us to throw in the towel to say, hey, you know what? I'm just not going to run this race anymore. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I got all of these things going on in my life. And what happens is, is we get discouraged. And when you listen to the voices uh, around you that are discouraging and voices that are negative, uh, you'll continue to be discouraged on the inside. You don't believe me? Go home and turn on the television and watch the news. Uh, you get discouraged very quickly, don't you? And we were talking about this yesterday, me and Angela. We were talking about when you look at the television, it's almost like everything you hear can be so discouraging. So that's why today what I want to do is I want to show you what God says in the book of Nehemiah that we've been studying in. We actually are going to go to Nehemiah chapter 4, the second part. And we're going to look at how God, very specifically in the book of Nehemiah, helps us to understand what causes discouragement in our lives and then we're going to look at how you deal with discouragement so that you don't get discouraged. You can continue to press forward and you don't get to the place that you feel like you're going to give up. Now, if you remember, if you haven't been with us in the series, uh, we're looking at the nation of Israel. They had been conquered by the Babylonian Empire and most of the people of Israel were taken prisoner. There were 70 years that had passed by. God put a dream uh, in Nehemiah's heart to go back and to build the wall there in Jerusalem. And so when we pick up in the story, that's exactly what's happening is they're there and they're building the wall. Now, in this part of the scripture that we come to today, we're going to see that Nehemiah and the people that were with him became discouraged. And Nehemiah shows us why they become discouraged, but he also shows us how they begin to deal with the discouragement that they were going through in their lives. And so what I want to do is I want you to look in your notes, if you would. I'm going to read this passage of Scripture, and I want us to kind of take a moment and just look at 
and understand what was going on here. And let me just set the tone for you just for a second. They're about halfway through building the wall. Um, it's going to tell us that here in just a moment. And let me just tell you this about life. It's usually at the halfway point that you get discouraged, right? It's usually at the halfway point in marriage. It's usually at the halfway point with raising kids. It's usually about halfway through just about anything that we do, we become discouraged and we feel like oftentimes giving up. I want you to join me as we, as we look at this passage of scripture to get together, uh, Nehemiah chapter 4 verses 6 through 12, and I want you to listen to what it says. It says, the people quickly rebuilt the first half of the wall around Jerusalem until it reached half its height because they worked hard with all of their hearts. But then notice what happens. It says, but then our enemies heard how Jerusalem's walls were being repaired and all of the gaps were being closed. They became very angry and plotted to attack Jerusalem together and create some confusion to stop the progress. So we prayed to God for protection and posted 24-hour guards to protect the workers. But then people began to complain. They said, we're tired and worn out. Besides that, there is so much rubble and trash to be removed, um, we now realize that we cannot finish this well. Also, our enemies are now threatening us. They're saying, before you, uh, before you know it or even see us, we'll, um, we'll be among you to kill you and end your work. And then those who lived closest to our enemies kept reporting over ten times that our enemies kept saying, we're going to attack you from every direction. I want to take a moment today in this brief story, and I want you to see how packed it is with practical advice for our lives. It's amazing to me when I read this story how I can see that it's important to understand that all of us get discouraged. Here they are accomplishing the vision and the dream that God had given them to rebuild the wall, Nehemiah specifically. And in the middle of trying to rebuild this wall, he gets halfway there and all of a sudden he becomes discouraged on the inside. Discouraged to the point that he and some of the people had begun to say to themselves, maybe we should just give up. Maybe we should not keep moving forward. Maybe we don't need to do this anymore. And it's important to understand that in this passage of Scripture, it details for us four causes that cause us to become discouraged. Maybe you don't realize this in your life, but anytime these things happen, this is what causes discouragement, and it causes you to feel like you want to give up, that you don't want to keep moving forward, or you don't want to keep pushing on. And so I want to share those four with you. There's four of them that we're going to see here in this passage of Scripture. The first cause of discouragement that every single one of us face is, and I want you to write this down, is the word fatigue. Fatigue. Fatigue causes discouragement. Listen to what he says here in this passage of scripture. It's important to, to hear the words. It says, then the people of Judah began to complain that the workers were becoming, what is the word there? Say it out loud together. Tired, right? They were tired. They were fatigued, and all of a sudden they find themselves uh, exhausted. And it's hard to rebuild when you're tired. It's hard to rebuild when you're exhausted. It's hard to work on your marriage when you're tired. It's hard to uh, be a school teacher when you're exhausted and you've gone home and you're halfway through the year and you don't feel like you can keep pushing forward. It's hard to build a great family when you're exhausted or you're tired. It's hard to do anything when you're tired. Now, friends, if you don't get anything else that I'm going to say, one of the most spiritual things that you can do in your life sometimes is go to sleep. Now, some of you are laughing. Some of you are like, well, they sleep too much already. No, listen to me for a second. It's important to understand that rest is very, very important for your life. And see, anytime you're fatigued, you'll become discouraged. I noticed that in my life, some of the times that I get, I guess you could say, uh, the most discouraged, some of the times that I want to throw in the towel and give up, are times when I'm tired. It's times when I've been working long hours, and I've been working really hard, and I find myself at a place that it's easy for me to get discouraged because I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm worn out. And you, you can see it in people, right? Uh, as a teacher, we just started back to school for teachers. Teachers, there's nothing like being fatigued and being tired. 
And you know what it's like. You've been in a classroom all day with kids, and sometimes you're just fatigued and tired, and you can become discouraged because uh, you're tired and because you're fatigued. Listen to what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 and 18. It says, Never forget how the um, Amalekites attacked you when you were exhausted and weary, and they struck down those who began to lag behind. You see, what it's telling us here is that when they were exhausted, when they were tired, the Amalekites came in and they attacked them. And let me tell you something about your life. When you're fatigued, that is when the enemy is going to come in and the enemy is going to begin to work in your life. That's when the enemy is going to begin to throw those sins that you struggle with in your life that you're trying to overcome. It's when he's going to whisper in your ear and tell you that you're not good enough or that you can't accomplish the task or that you need to quit and throw in the towel and just be done. Uh, the enemy will attack you when you're weak and when you're tired, right? And, and so when you're exhausted, the enemy comes along and he begins to say to you, you can't do this. You won't be able to accomplish this. And the next thing you know, he's going to begin to uh, attack you because he knows that you're exhausted. And so anytime you get discouraged, let me just tell you this. You need to stop and ask yourself, am I tired? Because if you're tired, that's when discouragement begins to build in your life. Number two, the second thing we see, the second cause for discouragement is the word frustration. The word frustration. First there's fatigue, now there's frustration. And it's the major cause, or one of the major causes of discouragement. You see, when you can't seem to get ahead... When you uh, think that the project that you're working on is more complex or difficult than you thought it was going to be, and you begin to get frustrated, frustration begins to cause discouragement. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 10, listen to what it says. It says, besides that, there was so much rubble and trash to be removed. Now remember, the walls had been torn down, the city had been burned, many of the houses had been destroyed. So it was much like, I guess you could say, when Hurricane Michael came through here. There was trash everywhere, right? There's rubble all over the place. I don't know if you remember, but when Hurricane Michael hit, I remember very, very specifically as Angela and I were driving home for the very first time. I remember weeks later driving down the road and rubble was stacked all over the place. Trash and heap loads of stuff. And Angela, she looked at me and she said, this is so discouraging. It's so depressing. And it's exactly what was happening here is that they, as they were building the wall, there was rubble all around them, and the rubble had caused them to become discouraged and to get frustrated because you can imagine they're having to move stuff around. They're having to reorganize things. They're having to pick up these rocks and try to fit them in the right place on the wall so they can rebuild the wall and put it together. And it's no different in your life. You, you probably know this. Uh, you've been frustrated in your life. Uh, maybe maybe you decide that you're going to clean out the filing cabinet. You ever done that before? And, you know, you open the filing cabinet, and you take all the files out, and you lay them on the floor, and you decide that you're going to try to start organizing them. And eventually, now, I don't know if this happened to any of y'all, but eventually you go, man, this is a bigger project than I thought. And you become discouraged, right? And you get frustrated because you're trying to organize stuff and put it back together and put it in the place it needs to be. Or what about this, ladies? Maybe y'all have done this. You decide you're going to clean out the closet. You ever done that? I could say you clean out the garage, right? We can, go, we can keep going. And you get frustrated. It's overwhelming, right? You get in there and you start taking all the clothes out and you start moving things around and you're trying to, you're trying to get it organized and you become frustrated because you realize there's more in there than I thought there was. Uh, this is more difficult than I thought it was going to be. And frustration begins to set in. And that's exactly what happened here is they became frustrated. And when they became frustrated, all of a sudden they begin to say, hey, you know what? We're discouraged. We want to give up. Now, let me ask you a question. What is the rubble in your life? What is the rubble in your life? You say, what do you mean, Pastor Marty? Well, rubble is the broken stuff that you keep tripping over in your life. And every single one of us have rubble in our life, right? You know what your rubble is. I know what my rubble is. But rubble is the broken stuff that you keep tripping over. And, and there, there's different kinds of like rubble in your life. For some of you, there is physical rubble, right? For them, it was the bricks, right? 
But for some of you, there's, there's physical rubble that you keep tripping over in your life. For some of you, uh, there's broken stuff in your life emotionally, relationally, financially. Uh, what is it that is broken in your life? What is the rubble that you keep tripping over in your life? And what you have to do is you have to realize, hey, I've got to do something with this rubble. Now, let me tell you what's important here. It's important to understand that when you look around and you see rubble, that you've got to do something with that rubble, right? And, and, and let me just give you three tips really quick. I, I didn't put them in your notes, but I just want to mention these very, very quickly. Here's the first one. I must continually clean the rubble out of my life. You must continually Clean the rubble out of your life. If there's emotional rubble, you've got to deal with it. If there's financial rubble that keeps you keep coming up against and it's creating frustration in your life, you've got to clean it up. You've got to deal with it. Uh, if there's physical rubble that you keep bumping up against and it keeps getting in the way, you've got to say, all right, I'm going to deal with this. It's important that you deal with it. But listen to this. Second rule of rubble removal is this. If I don't deal with it, it'll take over my life. You ever notice that? If you don't deal with it, it will take over your life. And so it's important that you deal with it so it doesn't take over your life because when you get frustrated, you become discouraged. And then notice this, the third rule is that I can't, um, or I'm sorry, the third rule, I can't always see my rubble, but others can see it. Now let me explain that for a second. See, sometimes we're too close to see the rubble, Right? And somebody else shows up into your life and they can see the rubble. And that's why it's important that you've got friends in your life that can say, hey, there's some rubble over here that you keep bumping up against or that you keep coming up against. You're you're frustrated because you haven't dealt with this. And they can help you to see the rubble in your life and help you to understand what you need to do because there's rubble that is piled up in every single one of our lives. In fact, listen to what it says in the book of Psalms. Psalm 25, verse 16, it says, Come, Lord, and show me mercy. Show me your mercy. Come, Lord, and show me your mercy, for I feel helpless, overwhelmed, and in deep distress. And you know what? That's a prayer that you can pray. God, I am frustrated and I am overwhelmed and I pray that you would show me mercy because, Lord, I feel helpless and overwhelmed and in deep distress because of this rubble that is in my life. And God will come and he will help you if you pray and you ask him to. Then notice this, number three. There's a third common cause of discouragement. and The third one is you've got fatigue, you've got frustration. The third one is the feeling of failure. The feeling of failure. Notice what it says. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10, he says, We now realize that we cannot finish this wall. We now realize that we cannot finish this wall. Here's what Nehemiah was saying. He said, you know what? We've bitten off more than we think we, are, or than we can accomplish. And so he's confused. He's thinking to himself, I don't know if we're going to be able to complete this project. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to, to take care of this. And all of us, in some ways, in our life, we sometimes feel like a failure. Let me just ask you a question, and I want you to be honest with yourself. Have you ever felt like a failure? You ever felt like, you know what, I just, I just can't do it. I mean, man, I just, I just failed at this. I remember early on when we first started the church, there was a Sunday that I just felt like a failure. And I don't remember all the details of what was going on, but I do remember this. I, I remember as plain as day. We were only about two years into planning the church. I had written my resignation. I had decided that I was going to leave. I'd already talked to Angela. I mean, I had it written out. And I'll never forget this. There was a guy in our church. He was one of my accountability partners. His name was Terrell McGee. And Terrell was with me that morning. We were by ourselves in a room. And I told him, I said, hey, I feel like a failure. I think I'm just going to quit. I'm going to resign. I'm going to begin to you know, look for something else, do something else. And I'll never forget, he got down on his knees in front of me, and he grabbed a hold of my hands, and he just started praying over me. And as he did, he started naming every single person in the church that had gotten saved over the first two years of the church that had been started. He just just started whispering their names. And I just started sobbing. I mean, I was just crying. As he mentioned their names, and we baptized them, and he he prayed over me, I just started crying because I realized in that moment that I wasn't a failure. 
that so many lives have been changed, that God was doing incredible, incredible stuff in the life of our church, but I felt so alone, and I felt like a failure in that moment. Can I tell you something? Some of you are there today. You feel like you've failed at your marriage. You feel like you've failed in raising your kids. You feel like maybe you failed at work, or you failed uh, uh, in a relationship, or you failed uh, financially. You, you just keep thinking to yourself, I'm a failure, but here's the reality. You're not a failure. Guys, all of us are going to fail. In fact, some of the most successful people in the world, I don't care if it's Steve Jobs or whoever you want to look at, if, you'll, if you look at their life, you'll see there are a series of failures that have happened over and over and over and over again. They have failed at so many things, but they eventually figured it out. It's the same in your life. Sometimes you're going to feel like a failure, and when you do feel like a failure, what do you do? You begin to get discouraged. In fact, Nehemiah 4.10 says uh, in, the, in another translation, we'll never be able to finish it. I mean, they, they were feeling like, hey, we failed. We're never going to be able to do this. And so there was this idea of failure that caused discouragement in their lives. And then notice this, number four. Here's the fourth common discouragement. We've got fear. We've got fatigue, frustration, failure. And then, um, I'm sorry, number four is fear. Fear causes discouragement. Listen to how they got afraid. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Also, our enemies are now threatening us. They're saying before you, no, before you know it, or even see us, we'll be among you to kill you and to end your work. So notice this, the people that were closest to them. Remember, we talked about this last week. The people that were to the north, the south, the east, and the west, they began to say, hey, we're going to come in and kill you. And what happened? They got fearful. And when they got fearful, they got discouraged. And all of a sudden, they find themselves living in fear because they're afraid that they're going to get attacked. And let me just tell you about your life. It's the same thing. Some of you are going to get threatened by other people. We talked about that last week, remember? We talked about how people will criticize you. We talked about how people will ridicule you. And and we talked about how to deal with that. But let me just tell you this. The fear that comes into our life oftentimes causes discouragement in our life. And so you may be here today, and you may be fearing. You're you're fearing something in your life. You're fearing maybe your boss. You're fearing maybe you're going to fail. You're fearing different things, and you find yourself struggling through that. And it's important to understand that any time there is fear in our life, we will become discouraged, and we will begin to start feeling like we want to give up. Listen to what it says in um, verse 12. It says, Then those who lived closest to our enemies kept reporting over ten times. That our enemies kept saying, we are going to attack you from every direction. So notice what's happening. They're saying it over and over again. We're going to attack you. We're going to attack you. They were, help, they, were, they were causing them to live in fear, right? And so they're afraid. They're afraid they're going to attack. They're afraid that they're going to sneak in at night and they're going to stab them in the back and they're going to try to take their life. And so out of that fear, they became discouraged. Now, let me just tell you this because I think this is important. If you hang out with negative people consistently and you listen to them, I promise you, you're going to get discouraged and you're going to live in fear. Let me just tell you something. If you don't believe this, all right? I to, I, I've told you all this before. I don't watch a lot of television, but I can tell you what. When I turn on the news and I watch it for about an hour, I'm scared. I sit there and go, man, this whole world is falling apart. I mean, everything, you know, Angela used to say, or or my parents used to say, the whole world's going to hell in a handbasket. Angela said, we ain't got a handbasket this time, right? (laughs) That's the way it seems. But See, here's, here's the deal. I want you to think about this just for a moment. In our lives, what happens is, is we start getting afraid, and when we get afraid, we get discouraged. Isn't it amazing how most people don't want to talk about the good things that are going on in this world? They don't want to talk about the positive things that are happening in life, the good things that are happening in life. Guys, there's goodness all out here around us. We just got to open up our eyes and see it and stop letting everybody show you the negative things that are happening in life. The, the, the wonderful things that are going on in our, in our neighborhoods, the wonderful things that are happening in our community and state and even our nation and even around the world. The, there, there's movements of God all over the place. But nobody's given that media coverage, right? 
And so what happens is, is when you begin to fear because of the things that you see or the things that you're hearing, all of a sudden you begin to what? You begin to think to yourself, man, I'm afraid, I'm discouraged, and you want to give up. Now, let's talk about this very quickly in closing. How can I defeat discouragement in my life? There are four things Nehemiah shows us here that we can do. Four things that we have to do. I'm sorry, I, I've got to drink some water. All right, here's what he says. Four things that have to happen if I'm going to overcome and defeat discouragement in my life. The first one is I've got to rest my body. We talked about this just a moment ago. The most spiritual thing that you can do is go home and get in the bed, all right? You've got to rest your body. Now, for some of you, that's hard. Let's just be honest. Some of you, like my wife, is an energizer bunny, right? I mean, I cannot get her to stop for anything. And sometimes I tell her, I say, Angela, the most spiritual thing you could do is take a nap. Just rest. She's like, no, there's work to be done. There's things that's got to be accomplished. I don't have time to rest, right? But the reality is you've got to rest. In Psalm 119, verse 73, listen to what it says. You made my body, Lord. Now give me sense to heed your laws. All right, listen to this. The Ten Commandments. Did you know that God made a commandment that says there should be a day of rest in your life? He commands us. He says you need to stop and you need to rest and you need to take it easy. Psalm 127 verse 2, it says, It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night. Does that sound familiar? Right? What does it say? Anxiously working for food to eat. For God gives rest to his loved ones. And so the way you overcome discouragement is you rest your body. You take some time to say, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rest. I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to relax. And that's important, right? I mean, some of us, when we go on vacation, we spend more time running around. And I don't know about you, but there's times I come home from vacation and I go, I need a vacation from vacation, right? Because you're just exhausted. You're tired. And God doesn't want that for you because guess what? That's where discouragement comes from. Why? Because you're tired, right? You're fatigued. Uh, You you find yourself uh, going, man, I just don't feel like I'm getting enough rest. And so he comes and he tells us, he says, you need to rest. In fact, listen to this. When you get home, I want you to read this story. In 1 Kings chapter 19, there is a guy by the name of Elijah. He was a prophet. And Elijah had just accomplished this big, huge task. He'd gone up against some atheists uh, that basically were saying there was no God. He had built an altar. He, he was basically fighting with them. And, and basically, uh, he found himself at the, at the very end of it. He was discouraged. He was de- um, depressed. In fact, I would say it's a, it's a classic case of burnout and depression. And what God does to him is God, I mean, or he, or Elijah says to God, he says, just kill me. Like, just take my life. That's how discouraged he was. And what God does is God feeds him, and then God puts him to sleep and lets him rest. And then he wakes up, and God feeds him, and then God puts him to sleep and lets him rest. And then he wakes up, and God feeds him, and then God puts him to sleep. And he lets him rest. And then he wakes up, and God feeds him, and then he puts him to sleep, and he lets him rest. What am I saying? One of the easiest ways to overcome discouragement is to rest my body. To take some time and say, you know what? I need some rest. It's important for me to be able to do that. Number two, the second thing, how how can I defeat discouragement in my life? Number two, reinforce my weak areas reinforce my weak areas. Notice what they did. Nehemiah 4 verse 13. It says, So I stationed armed guards at the most vulnerable points of the wall and at the most exposed places. I assigned people by families to protect each other with their swords, spears, and bows. What was he doing? Nehemiah looked around the wall and he saw where the most vulnerable places were. He knew where the weak spots were. And what did he do? He reinforced those weak spots. Now listen to me because this is important. Guys, some of you need to reinforce the weak spots in your life. The rubble that we were talking about just a few moments ago. You need to understand the only way that you are not going to become discouraged or continue to get discouraged is when you begin to to be 
honest about your weak spots, right? There are people that need to know about your weaknesses, those weak places in your life. Because listen to me, those weak places are the places that you're going to get discouraged the most. And so it's important that you have people that can encourage you and reinforce the weak areas in your life. That is why here at North Star, we believe small groups are such a huge part of your spiritual growth. Uh, you, you want to know, what, what's the opposite of discouragement? Encouragement, right? How are you going to get encouraged? you got to be around other people that can encourage you. Other people that can inspire you. Other people that can help you and hold you accountable in your life. And so I just want to tell you, and those of you that, that are watching online, I just want to say this because I think it's important. You need to get into a small group and you need to do life with other people. You don't need to forsake the assembling of God's people together so that you can grow and you can be encouraged and you have someone in your life that can help you and um, allow, you to, uh, allow you to be encouraged, right? We need encouragement from each other. And so you reinforce the weak areas of your life. Hebrews chapter two, uh, 10, verse 25. It says, some people have gotten out of the habit of meeting together with other believers. But we must not do that. Instead, we should keep on encouraging each other. That's why you need to be in a small group. You need other believers in your life that can encourage you and hold you accountable. They can stand behind you in the weak places of your life and help you and encourage you so that you don't become discouraged. And then notice this, number three, how can I defeat discouragement in my life? Refocus on God. Refocus on God. Notice what Nehemiah does. In Nehemiah chapter four, I mean, chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Aware of their anxieties, I stood up and said to the noble and officials and the rest of the people, Do not be what? Afraid. afraid, he says. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember who? The Lord, he says. Remember the Lord who is great and awe-inspiring. So what was Nehemiah doing? He was reminding them that they were working for God. He was reminding them of the goodness of God. He was reminding them that God had gotten them out of captivity and had brought them back to Jerusalem and allowed them to be able to rebuild the wall. And in your life, you've got to stop and you have to reflect and refocus on who God is in your life. Focus on God's goodness and focus on his grace. Remind yourself of his mercy in your life. Remind yourself of his faithfulness and how good he has been to you. Constantly refocus your mind. And you're the only one that can do that. See, if you're not careful, what do we do? You'll focus on all the negative things, right? Cut the TV off and focus on God. Like, be encouraged. God, thank you that... Even though it seems like this world is out of control, this book tells us that, God, you are in control. And, and it tells us exactly how it's going to end. Nobody's going to be surprised. We know exactly what's going to happen. And so you refocus on God and you say, hey, God, I want you to know that I'm going to focus on you. I'm going to remind myself of who you are. And I'm not going to be discouraged. I'm going to be encouraged because you are an incredible God. You're an amazing God, and you're doing amazing things in my life. And then notice this, Psalm 119, verse 25. I'm completely discouraged, so revive me with your word. Guys, it's his word that encourages us. It's his word that feeds our souls and feeds our hearts and helps us to focus on who he is and what he has done in our lives. And then notice this. How can I defeat discouragement in my life? Number four, resist the discouragement. Resist the discouragement. What do I mean by that? Listen, Nehemiah 4 verse 14. It says, I also told them you must fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. What was Nehemiah saying? He said, you got to fight. You got to resist you got to stand up. And in your life, anytime you start getting discouraged, you've got to resist discouragement. You've got to fight against discouragement. You've got to tell yourself, hey, what Pastor Marty said, I'm going to rest my body. I'm going to reinforce my weak areas. I'm going to focus on God. And I'm going to fight against this discouragement that keeps coming up against me in my life because it's going to cause me to want to throw in the towel. It's going to cause me to want to quit. And you've got to just resist it. In Psalm 142, verse 3, it says, when I am ready to give up. He knows what I should do. God knows what you should do. 
And when you're ready to give up, let me tell you something. I would have resigned from this church if it hadn't have been for Terrell McGee standing in front of me and, and holding my hands and looking me in the face and whispering the names of all of those people. God knew what I needed in that moment. And I'm just weeping and crying and going, man, Marty, you're so blind. Can't you see what God's doing? Look at what God is accomplishing. And then in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 29 and 31, it says God gives power to those who are tired and worn out, and he offers strength to the weak. Those who wait on the Lord will find new strength, right? So as you fight and you resist and you push, God does what? He strengthens you. He comes in and says, hey, don't be discouraged. Lift up your head and see the wonderful things that are happening and, and be encouraged in your life. And again, encouragement comes from what? Our brothers and sisters in Christ. Others who can come to us and help us uh, to be able to navigate and not um, be discouraged in our hearts. So I want you to know as your pastor, I want you to hear me here, okay? I want you to finish well. I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to finish well. I want to equip you and help you so that you can continue to run the race that God has called you to run. And you can run it with endurance and you can come across the finish line and know that you've given it your all. And so this week I prayed for you. And I'm going to pray for you today as we close. And I want to encourage you to not be discouraged. And when you do get discouraged, to do the things that we've talked about today so that you can be inspired and encouraged in your life to be who God wants you to be. So that you don't quit. And so that you don't throw in the towel. Listen to me. Don't, don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your kids. Don't give up at your job. Don't give up and become discouraged at the things that are going on in your life. Put your face towards God. Be encouraged by his word and others that are around you. And continue to pace yourself to run the race that God has so faithfully laid out for you to run in your life. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that God Nehemiah just um, encourages us. Because God, all of us get discouraged. There are people sitting in this room today. There are people online that are watching today. And God, as they sit there and they listen, they're discouraged in their heart. And what I pray more than anything else is, God, whether they're fatigued, whether they find themselves in a place that, that Lord, they're, they're frustrated or there's failure or fear that they're working through, I just pray that they would be encouraged today. And I pray that you would help us to encourage one another because, God, that is what you've called us to do. You've asked us to encourage each other. And so I pray over some of our people today. Some, some, somebody needs to go home and take a nap, God. And I pray that they would do that today. And some mother's thinking, well, you don't know my kids. But, God, I, I pray that somehow you would help her to be able to rest. And, God, I pray that you would help us to, to reinforce the weak spots in our lives. That we would have friends and people that know us that could come alongside us and, Lord, help us. And that we would refocus on you this week. That we would just not, not, not listen to the news and all the negative things that are out there. But, God, we would focus on you. And we would allow you to be an encouragement to us. And, God, we would focus on your grace and your love, and your mercy, and your kindness, and your power, and knowing that you are all-knowing and all-powerful, and God, we can trust you more than anything else. And maybe somebody's here today, and God, they're thinking about throwing in the towel. I pray that they would resist the discouragement, and I pray today that they would, they would just find new strength, and Lord, that you would do exactly what you said there in the book of Isaiah, that God, you, as they wait on you, you would fill them with new strength. And so, Lord, go with us now as we leave this place. Help us to follow you with all of our heart. And I pray that if we are discouraged, that, God, you would encourage us. And I pray this in the name that's above every other name, and that's the name of Jesus. And all of God's people together said amen and amen.